You're listening to If You Love This Planet. Now you'll hear an excerpt from a speech I gave at the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War Congress in Berlin on the 25th anniversary of Chernobyl in April 2011. I'm also dedicating this lecture to my friend and sister, Petra Kelly. Petra and I worked almost hand in hand. She did Europe and I did the United States during the 1980s um, when the threat of nuclear war was impending, when Ronald Reagan said over an open microphone, uh, I've, pressed, um, I've pressed the button, the missile, I'm paraphrasing, missiles have been launched. I met with Reagan in the White House for an hour and a quarter uh, I established quickly a doctor-patient relationship with him. I held his hand for at least half that time. He knew nothing about nuclear weapons or delivery systems or CIA reports. i just finished my book, Missile Envy, um, and so I would correct him. He would then get a mailer flush, uh, become very anxious, so I had to hold his hand to reassure him. I estimated his IQ to be average 100, but I also came out of the meeting saying I thought he had impending Alzheimer's disease, which indeed he did. He was the Commander-in-Chief in charge of thousands of hydrogen bombs with a three-minute decision time whether or not to launch. This is a very sad time in the history of the world. I have often imagined a major nuclear meltdown and have said for many years that that will end the nuclear industry. I never imagined four reactors having various stages of meltdowns built on an earthquake fault by a very capable um, people, the Japanese, and the fuel pools melting as well. I never imagined it. When I first heard about it four weeks ago, being a physician, I extrapolated the prognosis. If indeed one or more of those reactors break through the containment and we have another Chernobyl or two Chernobyls, that will mean millions of cases of cancer in the Northern Hemisphere. How hard do we work to try and save a child's life who's dying of leukemia or Wilms tumour? How hard do we work to try and save a woman's life who's dying of metastatic breast cancer? The medical dictum says if we have an incurable disease, the only way and recourse is prevention. The nuclear industry was begun... Well, I've got a fascinating book here. Um, it's called Radioactive. It's about Madame Curie and Pierre Curie. Um, and it's relevant, I think. When they first discovered X-rays, electricity, radio, the telegraph, the X-rays and radioactivity, at the turn of the 20th century, a series of invisible forces were radically transforming daily life. The advances were dazzling. For some time, they blurred the boundary between science and magic. If invisible light could pass through flesh and expose a human skeleton, was it so fantastical to believe in levitation, in telekinesis, in communicating with the dead? And this began a whole spiritualist movement in the mid-19th century, which seduced millions who were promising contact with the divine through ghosts and spirits. So we've always been fascinated with radiation, as was Madame Curie and Pierre Curie. They gave birth to death. Madame Curie died of aplastic anemia induced by radium. Pierre Curie he was run over by a horse and buggy. Her daughter, she died of leukemia too. We have known since the beginning of the nuclear age that, nu that radiation induces cancer. However, we're in the middle of a huge argument. The problem is the nuclear physicists since the dawn of the nuclear age, and I knew many of them, they were my friends, George Kistiakowski, who supplied the implosion mechanism for the first A-bomb, 
Vicky Wisecoff, Philip Morrison, Edward Teller, who I debated, and I beat him. Jerry Wiesner, who was Jack Kennedy's science advisor. Ted Taylor, who developed the suitcase hydrogen bomb. I knew them all. They were racked with guilt because they had helped to vaporise and kill over 200,000 people in a flash of light in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They thought if they could harness atoms for peace, then they could go to their graves relatively not guilty. They all went to their graves guilty. They knew right from the beginning the toxicity of plutonium. In fact, Glenn Seaborg, who developed plutonium-239, spoke about it at the beginning. Plutonium is so toxic that when injected into beagle dogs, there wasn't a dose low enough that didn't give every dog cancer, 10 to the minus 9 grams. It's said that a microgram is definitely carcinogenic, but it may be much lower. Each reactor manufactures 250 kilos of plutonium per year. It's only needed 2.5 kilos to make yourself an atomic bomb. The half-life of plutonium is 24,400 years. It lasts for a quarter of a million years or more. It is handled like iron by the body. It's an iron analogue. If inhaled, it induces lung cancer. And let me just point out that the nuclear industry is lying. It lies continuously. It talks about permissible doses of radiation. As we all know as physicians, there is no permissible dose of radiation. <clears throat> As we know as physicians, it is background radiation that induced evolution. Advantageous genes survived. Fish developed lungs. Birds developed wings. We, this magnificent species with a huge neocortex, opposing thumbs, standing on our hind legs, evolved. I happen to think we're an evolutionary aberrant. But most mutations are deleterious and induce disease. As we know, we all carry several hundred genes for disease, cystic fibrosis, diabetes, phenylketonuria, inborn errors of metabolism, dwarfism. There are now 2,600 genetic diseases described. Most are recessive. And yet George Monbiot, in his wisdom, accrued over three days reading some scientific and medical literature, said that surprisingly no genetic abnormalities were seen in the offspring of the Hibakusha at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Why not? Because either they were uh, fatal mutations, there were many spontaneous abortions, um, many children have been born with gross congenital abnormalities which are almost certainly teratogenic and this is described in this wonderful book put together, together by Yablikov and I can't wait to hear him speak later on and Nesterenko, two Nesterenkos photographs of children with phocomelia babies bo were born with anencephaly, cyclops, um, spina bifida, you name it there are homes full of children in Belarus and Ukraine of grossly deformed children. But most mutations are recessive, and it takes up to 20 generations for two recessive genes, i.e. cystic fibrosis, to get together to form a child with that particular disease. George Monbiot and his colleagues know nothing about genetics. Why? Because we have not taught them. The physicists all this time have prevailed since the 1940s in the Manhattan Project. When the physicists from Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore go to Congress, they almost have a Merlin's cap. They're magic. They walk into Congress, a red carpet's laid out in front of them, and the Congress people virtually lie down in front of them metaphorically because they've harnessed the energy inside the centre of the sun, E equals mc squared, the most enormous energy. What did Einstein say? 
The splitting, and this is the most profound statement I probably could make today, the splitting of the atom changed everything, all reality, save man's mode of thinking. Thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. They think of nuclear bombs like they thought of swords and jousting and pistols. They still think like that. The Pentagon talks like that. It's not the Department of Defense, it's the Department of Death. America is spending almost $1 trillion a year on death. And it doesn't have even a free medical care system because that's socialist or even communist. We are in a very terrible situation. And peaceful nuclear energy arose from these scientists' brains, capturing the heat of splitting the atom to boil water. As Einstein said, nuclear power is a hell of a way to boil water. And that's all nuclear power does. But in each reactor is as much, ra the, the uranium becomes one billion times more radioactive when fissioned in the reactor, one billion times. 200 new isotopes are made, some with half-lives of seconds, some with billions of years. And the nuclear industry talk about external radiation, background radiation. It used to be 170 millirems a year. Suddenly it's become okay to say it's 350 millirems a year. I said to my colleague Arjun Makajani, how did it suddenly rise and double? He said, oh, they're adding radon to background radiation. Some people live in houses with radon, most do not. No background radiation is safe. It adds already to the numbers of cancers we see now, maybe 30% or more. The Bear Report of the National Academy of Sciences, number seven, said that no radiation is safe, it's cumulative. Yet, everyone gets a dental x-ray once a year. Alice Stewart, she discovered that one x-ray to the pregnant abdomen to the fetus doubles the incidence of leukemia in that child's lifetime. She was shunned by the nuclear industry for years and made fun of. Her data now stands and is accepted with scientific validity. We, um, we do not learn in medical school what internal, internal emitters are. I did not learn what gamma radiation was, but I learned later that it is produced by radioactive isotopes, cesium, strontium, uh, cobalt-60, and we use it in the treatment of cancer. People are confused. Why do we use radiation to treat cancer? We don't explain that radiation kills actively dividing cells. That's why the fetus is thousands of times more radiosensitive than adults. Why babies and children are 10 to 20 times more radiosensitive. We've got X-ray machines at airports to walk through. They're radiating fetuses. They're radiating babies. They're irradiating immunocompromised people. This is wicked. And what do we do? Nothing. What did I learn? I was not taught in medical school what an alpha emitter was. I was not taught it was a particulate composed of two protons and two neutrons, which travels not very far. It doesn't penetrate dead la layers of epidermis to damage living dermal cells, but it's grossly mutagenic and it produces high levels of radiation to a very small volume of cells in the lung. Tiny volume. And as radiation decreases with the square of the distance, most cells die, but on the periphery of that volume, cells remain viable and mutate and develop cancer. People do not understand the latent period of carcinogenesis. They think that if you get irradiated, you'll drop dead. Sure. If you get 250 to 500 rems, LD50, half the people will die of acute radiation illness as the liquidators died and the liquidators at Fukushima are now dying. 